Well, good afternoon or good morning if you're on the West Coast and welcome to uh, our second general session. Uh, our sponsor for this session is Zarko, Einhorn, Sikowski, and Brito. And now I'm going to turn it over to Robert Einhorn, who's going to tell you a little bit about the session. Very good. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone. We have two dynamic speakers who are uh, serving as our panel today. Uh, both of them are strong and experienced advocates for the rights of franchisees. Neither of them actually needs an introduction because I'm sure they're well known to you, but nevertheless, here it is. Let me first introduce Keith Miller. Um, Keith Miller is the AEFD's uh, very own Director of Public Affairs and Engagement. And in this role, Keith has become a force to be reckoned with as a lobbyist uh, focusing on the, the rights of franchisees and a strong advocate for franchisees. Not only is Keith bright, articulate, and good looking, but he what makes Keith particularly effective as an advocate for franchisees is the fact that he is a franchisee himself. And he's been a Subway franchisee for almost 35 years, and he's still doing it today. He often tells us he's still you know, slinging sandwiches. And, and that makes him a very effective lobbyist. And it's because he not only talks the talk, but he walks the walk. And you can tell that he has the respect of, of government officials. And you, you saw that from our last session with his interaction with Mr. Chopra. And so we're very, the AFD is very fortunate and franchisees in general are, are very fortunate to have such a, a strong advocate and key. So keep up the great work. Uh, next, my partner, Robert Zarco. Robert has been a tireless advocate for the rights of franchisees for the past 35 years. He's the founding partner of my law firm. It's a national practice focused on the rights of franchisees. Um, Robert's represented franchisees from over 500 different brands all over the country and also internationally. He's handled some of the, the, the biggest precedential uh, cases in franchising, dating back to Sheck versus Burger King several years ago, to the more recent El Pollo Loco case out in California just the past couple years. And he's been at the forefront of not only precedent setting cases in franchising, but also has been a, an advocate for franchisees on the, the legislative front as well, and has testified before several legislative bodies. Through his dedication, hard work and care and, and, and help to franchisees, Robert has earned the reputation as the go-to lawyer for the toughest cases in franchising. And I'm proud to have him as my partner and I'm pleased to have such a strong a group working with us today. So gentlemen, it's all you. Well, thank you, Robert. And, and I guess Mr. Einhorn, because in your firm, we always have to go by last names because everybody's named Robert, which made which makes me a half partner because my middle name is Robert. So uh, first of all, I do want to, you know, at, at one time we had on our agenda um, an additional panelist guest speaker, Lena Khan, um, wanted to explain that a little. Uh, now Commissioner Khan was just confirmed a week ago uh, as a commissioner by the U.S. Senate into the Federal Trade Commission, uh, and which I don't think we knew it was coming, but it was a very strong, bold statement by uh, the Biden administration to also name her as chair. Um, she's not joining us today because She's busy. <laughs> when when she got confirmed one week out and then named as chair, I, I pretty much knew that was it. She at this point is not making any public appearances. Uh, she has her head down. I've talked to her staff. They are busy putting her team together and direction together. I can tell you, I did talk to her a couple months ago, and she makes a lot of news uh, about 
her stances in, on antitrust and, and big tech. And she really looks at franchising as much the same of the power imbalance that needs correction. And we had a very good talk about that. Um, from speaking with her, from now speaking with some of her staff and the people who have worked with her, I'm confident she's going to be a great friend of franchising. And uh, But I just wanted to explain it wasn't that we got stood up. She literally is very busy right now, and uh, we look forward to working with her. So the next thing is people were concerned, well, now it's just going to be you and Zarco. And my comment to that was, I have got to have the easiest job in the world because my job for the next hour is to keep Zarco talking for an hour. How hard can that be? <laughs> so let's get started, Zarco, on, on this. And um, yeah, your, your whole staff is probably behind you laughing about that one. They are, Keith, you're something special. They, <laughs> only, only you, but if anyone does know me, it is you. That's <laughs> That's <okay>. so, <laughs> so let's, let's talk about the FTC's unfair practices authority. And, and obviously, you know, now we get to talk about some of these things in light of what commissioner, the hour or 45 minutes we just heard from commissioner Chopra. Let's talk about maybe some of the current part of the franchise rule and what you see franchisees can do, what has been done and what maybe the FTC, what we should be pushing them to do. And it's fairly simple things of, I was given numbers that weren't disclosed in item 19. I was told I'd do a million dollars in sales and geez, I find out we all do $300,000 in sales and I'm going broke. What can I do? Uh, Keith, thanks a lot. You're, you're great to have as a co-panelist and I, I enjoy you on the phone, off the phone, whether we talk early in the morning or now uh, here in this, in this panel, uh, you bring a very unique, uh, angle not only because uh, you're a franchisee advocate, but because as an owner of Subway franchises, you are actually you know the boots on the ground and you understand that exactly how it works every day. Um, frankly, I, I want you to know I was very enlightened by what Commissioner Chopra had to say in, in terms of the uh, swinging of the pendulum, where there's a greater recognition for franchisee rights now than perhaps existed uh, in the past. The reality is that. Uh, as you and I have discussed uh, in the courtroom, the, the judges, as well as probably a lot of uh, Congress people, have a, a wrong impression with regard to the relationship between franchise or franchisee in this country and whether or not, in fact, franchisees uh, are being uh, abused in many circumstances and not in all circumstances, but on certain circumstances. But it is still an unequal playing field the, the, we have been working together, you know, in the legislator and like, you know, guys like you and many others to level the playing field. And the reality is that I think that uh, Commissioner Chopra's attitude and view is a breath of fresh air because we all know the perception of franchising in America, I believe in Congress, as well as in the courtroom is one that franchisees, especially if you're from a very well-known brand, uh, that all franchisees are very, very wealthy. And we know in actuality, uh, at least with most of our cases, that is not the case. In fact, franchisees are, are victims of abuse of arbitrary and capricious practices by franchisors, where the franchisors are making decisions based on what's good for the franchisor's bottom line without taking into account the impact that it has on the franchisee's bottom line. I remember years ago when I was talking to franchise franchisees in, in these large conferences, I was telling guys, as much as you're concerned today about the relationship between, between you as a franchisee and the franchisor, I foresee that over the next five to seven years, we're gonna have an onslaught of private equity. And what private equity is going to do in terms of the impact that that's gonna have on the relationship. And I anticipated it was gonna be worse. And the reality is it is worse. And the reason is for items such as you know, your first question with regard to, uh, you know, franchisees were provided numbers, you know, pro formas, prospectuses as to how their particular business was going to perform, yet item 19 in the FTD that was disclosed 
says that they do not make any financial performance representations. First and foremost, uh, that can give rise to a claim for misrepresentation by the franchisor to put on item 19 that there is not uh, any uh, pro forma or financial performance representation being made when in fact they are being made. They are being made by their own executives, they're being made by their brokers, they're being made by people that have, if not actual authority, apparent authority in the mind of the franchise uh, franchisee. The, the question there becomes one of, of reliance. Does the franchisee have the right to rely on the representations made uh, by the franchisor's representative before signing the franchise agreement when the franchise, uh, when item 19 says they would not? And you get to the issue of whether the reliance is reasonable or unreasonable. And there's cases that go both ways in that regard, depending on the circumstances, depends on the knowledge and how you can connect whether the person that actually made the representation uh, in the company was one that it understood that the FDD uh, had this uh, no disclosure or no representation statement and things of that sort. But this is a common problem. Um, judges go both ways. A lot of them give a lot of weight to the FDD. And also you have, don't forget, when you sign the franchise agreement, there are merger and integration clauses in those contracts. And those are the provisions at the end of the agreement that a lot of people don't look at because you know they're the lawyer that reviewed their franchise agreement for them maybe was the person who handled the real estate closing or prepared their will and was not necessarily a franchise expert and says oh don't worry about it this is all just standard boilerplate and the reality is that standard boilerplate can later become a huge defense for the franchisor that it said you are not to rely on anything that was said to you prior to getting into this relationship so um, be very wary of uh, any financial performance representations. Frankly, I would not rely on any one of them because later you will see that there are questionnaires in many of these franchise agreements where they ask you to sign, uh, to sign a document that reflects that you, in fact, acknowledge that you were not given any financial performance representations and you did not... <coughs> any statements from anyone that would talk, you know, tell you what it is that you can or cannot expect. And all of these documents, the more things you sign, the more they will come to haunt you later uh, when the time comes and a dispute arises. So where is the line? Okay, maybe I was wrongfully disclosed, but where's the legal line of, I was wrongfully disclosed versus outright fraud? It's uh, the, the line is is not necessarily always clear. Um, a, a fraud is a wrongful disclosure. A wrongful disclosure is not necessarily a fraud. And it goes to the issue of intent. You can have a wrongful disclosure made on, um, on negligence where someone says something that was incorrect. Someone says something that they knew they shouldn't have said. Somewhat, some franchise or representative provides you with documents that they did not realize they could not tell you. Uh, and they really did not intend to deceive you. Simply that's the best information they had, which they received from a source that they thought was reliable and it was not, and ultimately it was wrong. So there was no bad intent, it was simply uh, negligence on the part of the manner in which the work was carried out. Remember that the people that the franchisees are gonna speak with are people that have a motivation to puff or exaggerate the anticipated performance of the franchises because most of them are compensated based on uh, the sale of that particular franchise. There's commissions involved, there's bonuses involved, uh, there's quotas that are met uh, and which have been previously set and things of that sort. Fraud is where there's an actual intent, an underlying, it's called scienter in the law, an underlying intent to deceive for the purpose of the franchise or obtaining the uh, satisfaction of that quota requirement or obtaining the sale of that franchise because but for that fraudulent statement, the franchise or representative knows that that franchisee is not going to be purchasing the, uh, the business. And the question you have to look at is, is also 
uh, is the franchisor saying something that they know is not true? And to what extent is there an issue of duty to disclose? There's a, a lot of times you have an issue of a fraudulent misrepresentation, which is the, the, the fraud aspect of it. It was an intentional uh, affirmative statement of something that is not true. And then you have the other element, which is the fraudulent concealment, where there's a material fact that the franchise or knows uh, would impact the franchisee's decision but the franchisor does not disclose it. And then the, the battle there is, okay, does the franchisor have a duty to disclose it or not? Then you go into who has superior knowledge, was the information obtainable with proper due diligence, and things of that sort. Courts are putting a lot of focus and a lot of pressure on the franchisees undertaking due diligence. So for you to say, well, I didn't check, they told me I relied, the courts are not going to be favorable in that regard. They're going to consider you as a franchisee, typically as rather sophisticated, in some cases, very sophisticated. It's common for us to see situations where a franchisee is told that it's going to cost $500,000 to build out a location. Franchisee builds out the location and now costs 800000 And then the franchisee proceeds to build three more. And then wants to come back later when the system fails and says, I want you to give me the damages for the additional 300,000 on each of the four locations. First thing the judge says is you knew that it was over on the first uh, on the first location and yet you proceeded to build out the same business over and over again and now you want me to compensate you for the difference. So there's responsibility on the franchisee as well. There is franchise responsibility in the franchise or but the franchisee cannot stick their head in the ground. They've got to be very active and proactive and check and recheck and undertake through a due diligence effort as much investigation as possible. Okay, well, you, you bring up due diligence and probably one of the primary things I see in due diligence is make sure you call franchisees. Um, but yet, Many times franchisees have signed non-disparagement or non-disclosure agreements that prevents them from telling you potentially the truth. How can I do my due diligence um, if that? And, and in fact, if you look, uh, there's an FTC guideline to uh, purchasing a franchise and it talks directly about contacting existing franchisees, yet in the disclosure document documents, um, they're allowed to have, uh, you know, they do quote put it that they have non-disclosure agreements sometimes, but with these non-disparagement or non-disclosure agreements, it's very hard to do your due diligence. There's no question that under the uh, FTC rule, the franchise or has to follow all kinds of, regu of regulations and requirements uh, in terms of, you know, allowing the franchisees to talk to other franchisees, allowing and cooperating with the franchisees who are undertaking due diligence. The problem is, is that sometimes the franchisor uh, does not do so, and because of the current FTC rule has no private right of action, it is so difficult to get the FTC's backing on these kinds of, of, uh, of conduct by the franchisor. Uh, as a result of that, I think is why franchisors become a little more loose in terms of following the, the FTC rule. I was actually very happy to hear uh, Chopra talk about uh, how there are certain things that are not in the franchise rule that perhaps we should bring to his attention. And, and perhaps it would be wonderful if the FTC could start overseeing post-sale uh, uh, relationship issues and not just simply pre-sale disclosure uh, requirements. Well, and, and let's head on, we'll go to the relationship period in a second but you mentioned there's no private right of action. So you know, Mr. Chopra pretty much told us the FTC hasn't taken any action, yet there's a disclosure violation. What can I do about it? Well, the various states, actually most of the states in this country have what's called the Little FTC Act, which is the Unfair and Deceptive Trade Practices Act and claims uh, and statutes that exist in many states that give you an essence 
uh, the private right of action. So in essence, these statutes, what they say is that if, if there is a violation of the FTC rule, that gives rise to a violation of the Unfair and Deceptive Trade Practices Act. So in, in essence, a franchisee would have a private right, meaning independently, to be able to initiate a claim against the franchisor relying on these Unfair and Deceptive Trade Practices Acts. So let's move to after you sign the agreement. So pass the franchise rule and talk about, I guess, what not only franchisees can do on some specific instances, but what you think the FTC could do. Uh, again, as Commissioner Chopra mentioned, they have, you know, Section 5 of the FTC Act talks about unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. I mean, that's the wording out of it. And how do you think we can engage the FTC and get the FTC to actually act on these unfair business practices? And he touched on one briefly, you know, restrictions on vendors to franchisees. And the really the only reason for the restriction is to get kickbacks. Uh, they're not, you know, a perfect example of all, often in the lodging industry, they're required to buy a ma specific mattress that is somehow deemed, you know, that brand specific. And really all that company has done is gone to like Sealy mattresses and say, we want that mattress, but we want it in this color cloth instead. And now it comes a, becomes a proprietary product, even though there's no extra cost to make it. And the franchisor now charges double the amount to the franchisee only to get a kickback. What do you think the FTC could actually do on that? Frankly, I think that uh, being a governmental agency, which is always uh, tight on funding or limited on funding, it would be very tough, I think, for the uh, FTC to undertake and police uh, particular relationships of individuals uh, in the franchise world, you know, con considering the numerous uh, uh, franchisees that exist with the numerous franchisors and the multitude of issues that arise, I think it would be very tough for the FTC to become involved, you know, in that regard. However, uh, I do believe that they can expand uh, their their guidelines, if you may, or the standards with regard to what it is that a franchisor can and cannot do. And an example with, with regard to the issue of vendors and suppliers, it, it is very common. It is very common for vendors and, and suppliers to have a relationship with the franchisor where the franchisor gains some financial benefit for that relationship. It is very common for a franchisor to choose a vendor that is not the best vendor for the particular service or the particular product, but that vendor has agreed to provide kickbacks or rebates to the franchisor. The manner in which the uh, the, uh, the FTC ha has looked at that and, uh, and the manner in which the courts have looked at it is if in fact the franchisor has disclosed, which is a requirement um, in the FTD, that the franchisor disclosed that it is receiving re rebates uh, or financial uh, assistance or, or financial payment or compensation from a vendor or supplier, that if that is uh, disclosed and the amount is set forth, that it is permissible. I don't think that's enough. I don't think that's enough because if the franchise, once that is in there, the franchisee never contemplates that the amount of the, of the kickback or, or, or the amount of the rebate is going to be so much that it, it creates a competitive disadvantage to the franchisee in that business versus another person who's in the same industry and does not have that additional financial burden of paying much more money for that product or or that service so what you have there is uh the fdc should be able to say that even if you disclose it it is not enough the franchisee should be able to buy product and services from anyone in the marketplace that can offer the same standard, the same specifications for the same or better price. That so the franchisee, remember, he's an independent contractor where the franchisee can control the supply. What's happening, what's happened here, it's a slippery slope. The original intent 
behind the franchise or controlling the product distributor or the vendor is because there were the old uh, in KFC, say the 11 herbs and spices. Well, you can't have a person who's going to cook a KFC piece of chicken trying to mix their own spices because it's a, that's a secret recipe. So under that excuse, if you may, or that or that rationale, the franchisor was able to say, you're going to buy my product because that's the only one you can use. Of course, for the purpose of consistency in taste and quality. But that has slipped. It has slipped and, and extended where now they're saying, well, uh, we have a particular mattress made by someone just for us. I mean, let's be honest here. How different could the mattress be? You can take a mattress, you can cut it up, and somebody else will come in and make the same mattress with the same raw materials, put it together, perhaps even better, and perhaps for a lower price, because there does not have to be a payment made to the franchisor. Or the franchisor doesn't accept the payment, but simply accepts free product for their corporate locations. I've seen that as well. So the, the FTC, the FTC, I believe, does have the ability that they can curtail the abuse of how the franchisors are getting around it simply by the disclosure, because it's very difficult for the franchisee to assess what the impact is going to be on their business from a particular disclosure of a particular item until they're actually in the business and they're in the second, third, fifth year, and now new products are brought in and new pricing is set forth and the quality may be less, but the franchisor, you know, is getting fat and happy from it. The FTC can do more. Well, and I think you bring up the disclosure and if judges are using the disclosure, it's, it's actually an item I've testified on multiple times. You only get one disclosure. You know, if you have a 20 year contract, you're disclosed at the beginning of that 20 year contract. Now, nosy people like me go out and look at updated disclosures just to see what's happening. But I may have been disclosed that that previous year, the franchisor, let's say, took a 1% rebate. Let's just say on all materials that they got 1% rebate. Well, there's nothing really contractually it's usually in the franchise agreement that they can take rebates, doesn't limit it. Well, five years into my agreement, now they're taking 10% rebates, kickbacks, marking up the product, substantially changes my business model. That doesn't match my disclosure. Now what do we say to the FTC? And, and you're 10 years in, so you're past the statute of limitations. Well, the, the complication with that, that's a very good point. It's a, it's a reality. Um, Especially when private equity buys and, you know, as we've already somewhat okay. talked about, needs to increase their margins, the, you know, the franchisees are margins, so to speak. Yeah, franchisees lose their individual identity once private equity comes in and now you become store number 1283 and they don't care who you are, what you are, your history or that impact. What the franchisors put in these franchise agreements that I think is something that the FTC has to address somehow, and I'm not saying it's easy, okay, because then they start uh, you know, treading into the relationship element of the, uh, of the franchise or franchisee uh, relationship, which is that, that language that appears after every one of these rights that the franchisor sets forth in the FDD and in the contract, which states, as franchisor may deem necessary from time to time, or as franchisor may require at that, you know, at a particular moment in the future. I mean, provisions like that are, are what franchisors are relying upon to expand the rights uh, and the representations made in the FDD. For instance, uh, you're going to, you know, remodel this business as the franchisor deems necessary and appropriate to maintain their image or their brand image. Well, what does that mean? Is, is it $50,000 investment? Is it 150? Is it 400,000? Is there any kind of commercially reasonable uh, return on investment that you're gonna get from that requirement? Does it give rise to what the law recognizes as an agreement to agree? Are you agreeing now that you're going to agree in the future for something that you don't even know exists. And, and there's a, a bunch of case law that says that agreements to agree are not enforceable. However, you then get judges that look at the language that says, well, they told you they had the right 
to change uh, the, the uh, relationship, or not the relationship, they have the right to change their methods or their processes as they deem necessary and appropriate. Or, for instance, that they want to have the right to add new products and new services. Oh, you know what, let's go ahead and test. Uh, we're gonna start selling pizza, for instance, in a, in, a, in a burger franchise. So they make you buy the pizza oven and get all the equipment to do all that stuff. And now they try it for three months and say, you know what, it's not gonna work, it's a flop. Let's, let's get rid of it. And by the way, get rid of the pizza oven you just bought because it interferes with our ability to service our clients in the manner that we prepare the burgers, for example. So it, it's, it's complex because the franchisor is going to say, if we follow what you're saying, Mr. Miller and Mr. Zarco, that we don't have the right to do that, how can we predict, you know, in the year 2000, what's going to happen in the year 2015 when we have a 20 year agreement. And therefore, what in essence you are saying is you're precluding us from evolving and we're not able to keep up with our competition uh, in this industry, in this space. And therefore, do you really want to tie our hands where then you have uh, no ability to compete with the others? So it is not easy. It's not easy. And I don't know how many, how much resources the franchisees have, you know, uh, sorry, the, the FTC has to be able to do that. I mean, if, you, if you're saying that the FTC, you know, uh, has an authority to uh, keep uh, uh, suppliers or vendors, you know, in line, how much, how much is it going to cost them or how many resources can they put in to police that? Is it going to be a situation where a franchise association brings that to the FTC? Is it an individual that brings it to the FTC? And then how many complaints are there around the country that they can attack? And that's, I think, one of the biggest frustrations we have. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things, and, I, you know, by talking with the people at the FTC is, gee, if the FTC would just do one case a year, <laughs> you know, against one franchisor, that would send a signal to the industry, you better be careful. Uh, the problem is they really in decades haven't taken any cases um, that we know of. Now, maybe they're finally doing something on Burger M after California did, um, but they're also very secretive, which is, is fair on, on investigations. They're not going to tell you who they're investigating. But the problem is, you know, even if they started making an example or two, it might change the industry. The thing, though, is that the Burger M situation it was an extreme situation, an extreme situation that's pretty black and white, that anywhere you go, you're not going to get a different opinion as to what the wrongful conduct was and whether or not there was wrongful conduct. I'm talking about, and you're talking about, the number of regular franchisees that are not in that extraordinarily extreme situation like Burger M that on a daily basis that on a daily basis are facing franchise or abuse in terms of again the impl the imposition to buy products from particular vendors uh, and suppliers uh, the the uh, elimination of territorial rights the change in the business concept that could cross the line uh, of the franchise uh, rule uh, limitation that says that the franchisee, excuse me, that the franchisor cannot make a change or amend the franchise agreement or the relationship to an extent that it is deemed a fundamental change in the concept. That's a that's a, a wonderful limiter where it says the franchisor cannot uh, make a change that constitutes or gives rise to a fundal fundamental change in the concept. But where is that line? What, what does that mean? That if you sell hamburgers, you can't sell hot dogs? They're going to say they're both meat, meat products. Are you saying that if I'm in the hamburger and chicken business, uh, I can't go vegan? Then they're going to say, then you're not allowing me to evolve and you require me to cut off a substantial you know, uh, percentage of the market out there. And, and that's why I think the FTC is trying to say, I don't want to be involved in what they perceive to be the minutia. And, and that's the, the, the concern. Well, so let's bring that down to probably the where most franchisees see this, 
and that is changes in the operations manual that fundamentally change a franchise agreement. You know, if, if Chick-fil-A now went to their franchisees and said, you're not going to be open on Sunday because we're putting it in the operations manual. We're seeing many new fees, you know, whether a loyalty program fees, IT fees being added on, you know, remodels that weren't fully disclosed, new equipment, you mentioned new products, you know, now you have to bring in a new fryer for a new chicken that is on the franchisees. Basically, where's the line that this has fundamentally and substantially changed my simple business that I bought into? And where do you think the FTC can step in on that at some point? Again, we're talking future because we know they don't step in now, but if we look at section five of the unfair trade practices, is there a line that we think we can push there? I believe that if there is an area of abuse between the franchise or franchisee that the FTC should come into and become involved is what I deem the misuse of the operations manual, which they believe gives them the right to, in essence, change the contract. Because there are certain franchise agreements that talk about how the franchise fr franchise relationship includes what is set forth in the operations manual. There's other franchise agreements that make no mention of the operations manual and specifically say that the operations manual is not part of the agreement. And the reason they do that is because they know that if it's part of the contract, they can't be changing it because then it would be a unilateral change that's not enforceable. So they use the operations manual as, in essence, a policy, a policy manual that gives, uh, that sets forth the methods and procedures that in the agree in the franchise agreement says our operations manual that may be changed from time to time as franchise or deems necessary, as I addressed earlier. So what's happening is they are changing the franchise relationship by making amendments, by making amendments uh, to the franchise uh, operations manual. And that uh, franchise operations manual, while it is typically something that uh, almost all franchisors have in their business, not all of them do. And some of them, I've seen manuals that I swear are 10 pages long, and I've seen some that are 3,000 pages long or longer. And if you're talking about McDonald's, the volumes is volumes and volumes of binders. So the reality is that I believe the FTC should be able to put a limitation with regard to the extent that a franchisor can modify the business and or that the franchisor has to make a business case to the franchisee community who has the boots on the ground that knows and understands how the business is being operated and how the consumer uh, in their uh, markets will, would react or expect it to react to certain things. Or better yet, many franchisors are not actually undertaking market tests of products, of services uh, in either their own locations or any other locations and are imposing many of these changes on the franchisees without such you know empirical evidence that could substantiate and support these changes uh in the business and the operations manual is being used to undertake that and many franchisees who are not pro who either don't have lawyers or are not represented by lawyers who understand and eat breathe and leave franchising will think that well it says that the franchisor deems necessary and proper so i guess they have the right and I know clients that have been told that uh, from other people, other lawyers. And I said, that's not, that's not the right advice. The reality is that is not the way it's supposed to be done. So a lot of these franchise um, uh, operations manuals are being used as a way to modify the franchise agreement unilaterally. And you can get actually uh, experts in, in an industry, you can get franchise experts, you can get uh, individuals that will get up and say, hey, my business was run this way and now it's run the other way. And, and frankly, that's a fundamental change in the concept or it's an amendment that's unilateral and uh, it's not, I don't have the consent. Now, one thing that's interesting, a lot of these amendments to these agreements uh, in the modification language of the contract require 
uh, franchisor says, this agreement cannot be modified or amended unless set forth in writing and mutually agreed to between the parties. You can rely on that and say, hey, the change you've made in the operations manual is tantamount to a change in the franchise agreement. And yes, it's in writing because you put it in there, but I didn't sign it off. And a lot of times franchisees are being asked to sign off on certain things. And, and franchisees need to understand that every time they are asked to sign off on anything, that means that the franchisor is cognizant and aware and understands that what they're imposing on the franchisee to do is not automatically uh, permitted or set forth in the franchise agreement. So the reason they ask you to sign it as is, yes, it's a, not an innocuous policy or an innocuous program, just go ahead and sign it. We just want to make sure that we're all, on, you know, there's no misunderstanding that every time there is a signature that is a that is an amendment to the agreement. And that's something the franchisees have to be very, very careful about. I think uh, James Dolan had kind of asked a question. I think it ties into that of, you know, a franchisor acquires a different franchise brand that may be an add on, maybe. Me, I'm a subway guy. Maybe they buy one of the pretzel companies as a snack thing. Can they be required? How can they make that required? I'm guessing it's one of those signatures to change the original contract. And uh, how can that be pushed? And I guess you then have to answer well, obviously, if it requires a signature, I can refuse not to sign it. But then the retaliation factor comes in. My life might get very difficult. Actually, it's it's uh, this is a very common thing, uh, and it's occurring more and more now uh, with private equity coming in and buying a franchise brand and then buying others and things of that sort, some of which could be competitive. The reality is that there are many franchise agreements that have provisions in there that set forth the right of the franchise or to sell itself, to acquire other brands, to merge and to undertake other business transactions that do not require the approval of the franchisee. That is already in writing in many, many franchise agreements, again, in those innocuous paragraphs that most people don't even read, but they are there. And I was recently involved in a case involving those particular provisions involving a merger. And the issue there had to do with whether or not you had there was a duty to disclose a merger before it occurred or did not occur and the franchisor's position would be well i put in the franchise agreement that i have the right to buy to sell to merge to acquire and once i already told you that then what duty do i have to tell you again that's number one number two number two is well if they go ahead and acquire one and they want you to sign it don't, uh, they're not asking you for the permission. You know what they're doing? They're, it's, it's in the presentation. Listen, we've just acquired this other brand. Uh, that's, it's an additional product or an additional service that we're providing. And I'm gonna, I think you're gonna wanna do that, but you know what? We don't want any trouble later with regard to uh, you not having had the authority to use our new brand that's gonna be wonderful for you. So to protect yourself, I think you should sign this so that you can later say and you can show that in fact you had the authority uh, to use this. So they reverse it in terms of the presentation. But look at the agreements when that happens. And if there is no right in the agreement to do so, they may have a duty to disclose it. And then what is the impact that that new acquisition has on your business? Is it a direct competitor? which together the two brands can flourish even better because there's synergies between the competitor coming in that the existing brand can utilize to expand by offering a service that previously was only offered by the competitor and vice versa. That could be okay. But what about if, what happens if the new brand comes in to the detriment and destruction and elimination of the existing brand? That's a completely different scenario. So there are rights that the franchisor that the franchisor has, and but the franchisee has rights. And the question is, how is that navigated through by both the franchisor and its imposition, 
or the franchisee in terms of whether it considers that acquisition positive or negative. So let's move to, you know, I'm trying to sell my outlets, but geez, they've changed the franchise agreement so much over the last 10 years. What I've built up in my business and the equity I would see looking at what I've done is really worth a lot less because of that change in that franchise agreement. I always joke, you know, 30 years ago, franchise agreements were five to eight pages and now they're 50 to 100 pages. And I bet there's not one word in those extra pages that's good for franchisees. Uh, they, um, but, you know, the new so I have a business, let's say I'm running it. I have five percent royalties and I have territorial rights to a protected trade area. And I'm only required to be open from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. The new contract says royalties are now 8% instead of 5. It won't allow any territorial rights and requires me to be open 24 hours. I mean, my business is kind of worthless based on that new contract. That one is a tricky uh, issue. It happens often, but it's tricky because there are a lot of different elements that come into that. Obviously, I gave extreme examples. But, no, but, but, but it's a great example because it's a reality. First and foremost, if it's a provision that is being implemented in a new contract term, meaning your 10 years have expired, or your 20 years has expired, and now there's a new franchise agreement that comes in and has new terms, the franchisor's view is then don't sign it. If you don't like it, don't sign it. At which point you as a franchisee have to make a business decision and say, am I better off with them or not with them? And I have to take into account the non-competition provisions, how much money am I making? How much money could have I made? Could I, do I go into another business and things of that sort? But you also have to look at relationship statutes that may exist in those states. In those particular states, you may have a statute that says that the franchise or must offer your renewal. So that means that then you do actually have the right to go forward without necessarily the franchisor saying you don't have a right, which means you may have an expectation. And then the franchisor's changes have to be reasonable because if they're unreasonable, then it's an almost tantamount or in essence, like not even offering you the franchise. If you have a 5% royalty and, and you're, you know, you're working nine to five and they're telling you you're going to now pay 10% and open 24 hours, that is a fundamental change in the concept, I would believe. When you go to a 24-hour business, there's many, many other factors that come in. Uh, and as a result, in, in addition to a, an FTC rule violation, you may have simply you know, commercially reasonable uh, renewal terms, which could be in violation of that statute. So, uh, that's one thing. Many franchise wars, and there's cases out there that say that when you buy a franchise, what you're literally doing is you are paying a fee, you are paying a total price to quote unquote rent the business. In other words, you're paying the right to operate or otherwise lease the business system for this particular term. But once that 20 year term is done, your lease expired. You knew that when you signed on. And then at that point, the franchisor says, yes, you can go on. Or you say, I know I don't want to go on. And then that depends on whether you have options in the franchise agreement. And if you have options at who's right, are they by mutual agreement? And this, what does the option say? Is the agreement going to be extended? Uh, is the agreement going to be renewed? Renewal and extension are two different words. Renewal implies that you are renewing your existing agreement. Extension could mean that you're extending the term under new terms. You may have the right to sign a new franchise agreement under the then current terms being offered to new franchisees coming in at that time. It's all in the wording. The FTC can play an important role in that regard, that if the franchisee has a renewal provision, that there cannot be a material change in the terms to the point 
that it becomes a fundamental change in the concept or a fundamental change in the business model. And I think that when we approach the FTC in that regard, we should build on that provision that talks about there cannot be a fundamental change in the concept. You see, and then that that will allow you to do that. Now, I, if, I, if, I love when you use the word rent your business for twenty years because many franchise or lawyers will try to say that. Well, that's all you're obligated to. Of course, then I always throw back. So, you mean I really didn't own anything? Therefore, if I didn't own anything, I couldn't be an independent contractor. So you must be a joint employer, obviously. <laughs> all right. Well, that. that Yes, you and I can take that <laughs> level, but that's beyond, way beyond the scope, you know, of, of this uh, seminar here today. Uh, but we, yes, we can make a lot of hay out of that position. But their point is, yes, you did own something. You owned the right to operate. It's like you, you know, you go and you lease a car. You own the right to operate it for three years. After three years, you got to give it back or do whatever else arises from that. the The issue is more important where you are in term, where you're in the middle of your 10, 15 year franchise agreement, and then they make the imposition of changing hours, uh, of increasing or setting maximum prices, setting minimum prices, telling you that you're gonna go from which closing down at eight to closing down at 2 a.m., telling you that you have to offer all of these uh, products at a maximum price of, then you get into antitrust laws. Then you get into state oil versus con and, and the Liggett case. And then franchisors telling you, well, under state oil versus con, we have the right to set maximum prices. And under Liggett, we have the right to set minimum price. Well, that's not true. That's not true because there is a rule of reason analysis that applies to that. It's not completely, you know, per se that they automatically have that. So the reality is, uh, when you are in a situation in term is one thing, but if you're in a situation where um, there is a, uh, a new franchise agreement is something else. The same way, what happens if you are, at, if you have a franchise agreement and you're midterm and you want to sell it and you want to sell it to a franchise, to a new prospective franchisee and the franchisor says, well, the new franchisee who's buying your business has to sign the then current franchise agreement. What happens there? What happens to your equity when you had a five mile protected territory and the new franchise agreements have no territory? What happens when you were paying 5% and the new agreements have 8% and all the other changes that you know can translate into an evisceration of the equity value of your franchise? You know, what do you do there? So let's move on to another huge problem, advertising funds. And they're kind of documented in the disclosure document, but whether actually, you know, it's, you see a lot of the language of in, in disclosure documents on either the rebates or advertising funds that they will be used to the benefit of franchisees. Well, what does that mean and who audits it and how do they prove that for what they're disclosing? I mean, say, saying it doesn't make it so. And, uh, you know, the advertising funds, there's no transparency. And so there's part of the disclosure on the transparency, what's being spent on. And then kind of a second part of advertising funds is, does it become an unfair business practice at some point when the franchisor is only using those funds to promote items that are profitable for them at the expense of the margins of the franchisees. The advertising and marketing fund uh, is probably one of the most abused and most fertile areas for dispute between franchisor and franchisee is because the marketing fund, when you look at it in terms of its the, the disclosure in the contracts as well as in the FTD talks about how the marketing fund will be used for uh, promoting the brand, expanding the brand, building the brand, and any other manner that the franchise or deems necessary and appropriate to make uh, to increase the value and goodwill of that brand. Well, these are very, very broad statements. 
You also have another provision with a franchisor. Um, initially, this provision was created. And again, all these are restrictive provisions, Keith, you and I know because we've been around this for over 30 years, is that when they were first created, these provisions, they had a really legitimate intent. But then they became you know, subject to uh, abuse. For instance, the provision that says franchisor does not warranty or guarantee that the amount of advertising and marketing benefits that you will receive is uh, directly related or proportionate to the amount that you've contributed. That provision made sense 15, 20 years ago because what was happening is people were saying, well, wait a second. I went ahead and I contributed you know, $1,000 worth for, for advertising and marketing, and yet instead of getting, which is 10% of the total budget, and yet for some reason on TV, I don't see myself, and on radio, I don't see myself, so I'm only getting 2% benefit when I paid in 10%. And again, the numbers are exaggerated for to make the, you know, the, the point. So the franchisor, based on the way the marketing was coming out, you know, newspapers and magazines and door, you know, door hangers, and TV and radio, it's very tough to be able to predict what percentage of that advertising is actually benefiting you. So they go ahead and they put that provision in to protect themselves from all of these lawsuits. Well, what happens later? The same provision is now being used for franchisor to go ahead and say, you know what, I have a, a, a market of stores in Alabama or in Milwaukee or in Phoenix that I corporate stores that I really don't want to operate as the corporate you know, as the corporate stores. So the franchisor goes ahead and I call it the pump and dump uh, philosophy, which is they pump a lot of marketing and advertising dollars into these markets in order to increase the sales. And once they increase the sales and revenue of those stores, therefore increasing the net, the net income, which once you apply the multiplier increases the value of the store, they sell the store. During that time of marketing those corporate markets to increase their sales, to be able to achieve the ability to sell their markets, there are other markets that are being deprived of those marketing and advertising dollars. Well, that's not good faith. That's not appropriate. And if you can show that that's what happened with the dollars, regardless of that provision in the agreement, I will tell you that I think that you have a very good argument. The problem is that it takes financial experts, advertising and marketing experts, you know, to be able to actually set forth, you know, what amount of those advertising and marketing dollars were used and for what purpose. That's one big area of abuse where particular markets of favored franchisees or favored markets that the franchisor wants to develop are receiving an, a disproportionate amount of the advertising and marketing dollars. What is worse than that is when the franchisor is taking um, these marketing dollars and advertising dollars and using them to operate and fund what would otherwise be operational expenses. And I'm seeing a lot of that where you have a person who is the, um, the franchise business consultant that's responsible for servicing the franchisee, providing the service and support, and goes out to evaluate and look at the sites. And all of a sudden, they're going to put, they're going to say that that individual now has as an additional duty a uh, marketing coordinator or marketing field analyst, in addition to being the franchise business consultant. The reason that is being done is now they transfer the entire salary and income of that person. Okay. They, they transfer that entire salary and income over to the marketing budget, which then frees that expense from the operating account, which in turn, by the reduction of expenses, increases the net income of the company, which in turn, once you, you apply the, the financial multiple of seven or eight times the net income of EBITDA, increases the equity value of the whole company, and then they do that in order to sell the company to a private equity fund, which in turn takes that situation, further cuts costs, increases revenue by transferring more money out of the operating fund, uh, more expenses out of the operating, transferring to marketing, and the cycle continues. It's, it's one of the most abused areas of advertising and marketing. Yeah, it's kind of a blank check. I mean, I hear of 
people while our CEO came out to visit it and their first class ticket and everything else was paid by the marketing fund because they were promoting the brand, <laughs> you know, because that's what the contracts say. So let's talk about, you know, kind of another issue of even private equity that I'm hearing about, and that is private equity franchisees. You know, there's private equity franchisees where there's a, a fund that's buying multiple stores. They tend to become the very large franchisee and uh, franchisees with having an unequal treatment uh, based on that, that that private equity franchisee is given better deals, maybe on royalties, maybe even on cost of goods and services. So it's an unequal competition. Uh, if one of these people buy a, an outlet close to me, I can't compete with that outlet. And now they get to buy my outlet because I got to get out. I'm not making money and they're buying my outlet for pennies on the dollar. Um, and companies are sometimes giving the first right of refusal to these private equity um, franchisees. They're assigning their first right of refusal. So the little guy's getting squeezed out. You are full of great questions today. I, I really like this because uh, there, these are issues that uh, a lot of franchisees are, are not aware of. So let's talk about the history of this again. Um, the history was where all franchisees are created equal meaning franchisees being part of the same system, having the same franchise agreements, have the right to obtain the same level of service, assistance, and support for the franchisor. There were circumstances, however, in which that was not the case. A particular market was in dire need of additional assistance, or a particular franchisee, as a result of some unexpected circumstance, uh, found themselves to be in a situation where they were financially you know, deprived and in a very uh, economically unfeasible situation, and the franchisor would provide financial assistance to remedy that franchisee's problem temporarily. Franch other franchisees would complain that they learned that this particular franchisee who's in dire financial straits got financial assistance from the franchisor, and that therefore they wanted financial assistance as well and would file lawsuits for breach of the implied covenants of good faith and fair dealing that the franchisor was not dealing fairly with them. And as evidence, they use the fact that that franchisor was providing financial assistance and benefits and support to other franchisees that were not being provided to the franchisee that was complaining. Cases are out there demonstrate that some of those franchisees that were not being treated fairly, were not receiving the same benefits, were in fact successful. So what does the franchisor do? do? What the franchisor does is the franchisor goes ahead and says that uh, we're going to put in the franchise agreement a provision that says franchisee acknowledges that from time to time franchisor may find the need to provide additional financial support or assistance or whatever else to it on another franchisee and you franchisee acknowledge that you will not make any claim for that and recognize that that's something that we're allowed to do. And the reason for that provision, the same way as the provision that says we will, that you franchisee acknowledge you're not gonna receive advertising in the same proportion to the amount that you contribute was to protect the franchisor from unreasonable lawsuits. The reality is, the reality is that um, the franchisors have now taken that provision in the disparate treatment situation and i've said well if i've got an amazing franchisee private equity group coming in that's going to buy 50 100 150 locations this private equity is negotiating with the franchise or say i will buy a block of these or i will sign a big area development agreement but i want favored terms i want favorable terms franchisor relies on the disparate treatment provision that exists in the other franchisees contracts makes the deal with the new private equity franchisee who then has a competitive advantage over the existing smaller franchisees and that's where the problem arises the franchisor may perhaps get challenged by the existing franchisee and the franchisor will say your franchise agreement specifically says 
that I have the right to do that. This is where the FTC can come in on each one of these steps and issues that we have talked about. And there's a way to put some kind of sp a stop gap provision that these kinds of situations cannot exist. For instance, franchisee is entitled to, to uh, arrange a different financial term for an existing franchisee and then the FTC can say, so long as the existing fran as the franchisee in trouble can establish that it is in dire financial uh, you know, straits or things of that sort. And not someone who's trying to just negotiate a much better deal with that brand to the detriment of the existing franchisees. So one of the last things, uh, and we'll be quick on this because I want to invite Bob Pervin in to kind of make a few final comments since we're coming to the end of our time. See, it wasn't hard to keep you talking for an hour. Knew that wouldn't be hard. <laughs> yeah. um, can a franchisor really terminate me based on a number of complaints or customer ratings? Uh, that's what they're now putting in franchise agreements that if you get three complaints in a year's time, they can terminate me. Yet some of those complaints based on, like for me, if Subway you don't put enough meat on the sandwich. Well, I follow the formula. You know, the formula is a formula, and yet that complaint counts against me. Any thoughts of that as an unfair? Because you can see how that could be used to get rid of franchise in retaliation mode for franchisees they want to get rid of potentially. Are you asking me or are you asking Yeah, Bob? yeah, yeah, you, Zarko. Oh, I'm and then, sorry. then Bob's going to then Bob's going to comment I after saw, you finish I, your question. I saw Bob Pervin's cute face, and I said, "Oh, the man of the hour is going to come in and, and do a cleanup." <laughs> <laughs> the, the answer to that question is um, that provision is very dangerous. Okay, when a franchisee is put in default three times, which gives rise to the to a termination, is a provision that again. Let's go back to the original history of it. The original history was the franchisees believed that they had a cure period of seven days, 10 days, 30 days, and they would go into a default status not re without a care because they knew they could cure, whether it be a financial default or operational default, within that 30-day you know, period. What happened is in franchise, these particular franchisees were repetitive defaulters. So a franchisor found themselves in a situation where a particular franchisee could default literally 20 times, 25 times in a year. I've seen that. I've, everything I've told you today, I have experienced personally in my years of, of practicing this uh, area of law. So the franchisor, to make sure that franchisees understood that they were not going to tolerate and not going to take it anymore, the fact that they're going to continue to be repetitive or serial defaulters said, if you default more than three times in any particular uh, time period, any particular year, uh, that will give rise to an automatic termination by the franchisor or the franchisor has the right to terminate. Again, like the marketing fund, like the others, this be it's become a provision of abuse. And the provision of abuse is now the franchisor, for a particular reason, you have a very vocal franchisee that gets up there and complains about anything and everything. And the franchisor says, I want this franchisee out. So what do they do? They send you a notice of default on an innocuous provision in the franchise agreement that most franchisees are in default in. Whether it be there's a cracked tile in the corner of the bathroom whether it be the fact that you are sending in your year-end financials or your quarterly financials a day late or a week late, or when you send in your financials, you forgot to send certain portions of the financials, or things that the franchisor required the franchisee to do that they, that they did not do. For instance, in your business, that the amount of meat on the sandwich was not correct. It's not that you told them, you know, cheat the customer. Maybe the individual that was doing didn't listen carefully, didn't, wasn't getting it right. So now technically you're in default because, you know, a six inch sub is now five inches uh, or something along those lines. The franchisor, I have seen the thing, I have two or three cases on this now where there are serial default letters being sent by the franchisor 
to the franchisee, which are truly concocted pretextual simply because their ultimate goal is to get the franchisee out of the business. So uh, again, you can you can put quality the FTC can say in the event that you're going to put a limitation on the amount of defaults uh, that can occur uh, before a franchisee is terminated or there has to be uh, you have the right to set a, a maximum number of defaults before you give the franchisee a termination notice. There has to be some language that the default has to be material and it cannot be pretextual and it has to be in good faith. Again, what's good faith? Unfortunately, that that can give rise to a mediation, arbitration, or litigation if the parties don't agree. So, look, in, in sum, from what we from what we have here, because time is running short, and, and we want you know the wisdom of Oz, uh, Mr. Irvin, <laughs> you know, to, to be uh, expounded on us. If the forty-three seconds, if the franchisors would act the way that the contracts were intended to be performed in good faith both sides uh, acting in a manner that would not deprive the other of earning the fruits of the contract which is the good faith standard we would not be having these problems unfortunately there's abuse substantial abuse on the franchisor side and frankly i have to confess there's abuse sometimes on the franchisee side where they try to take advantage and, and, the, and the better their lawyer is the more sometimes they want to take advantage because they feel they have a great insurance policy so we all have to work together the FTC can, it can help, but it's not the all in all. It's not going to be the final arbiter of all of these issues because there's going to be so many uh, fact specific case by case aspects we have to deal with that hopefully people will realize that if we all get together, we'll, we'll live in a better place with a much more mutually beneficial relationship. So, Bob, you get to end us. Okay, I get the last word. Word the uh, uh, <laughs> I, I I am reminded that uh, of a subway franchisee that was written up because he had fingerprints on his front door. Um, the, uh, the Keith, you may know that guy, uh, but uh, I did want to come in and relate to you. I want to thank all of you for being here, uh, and and what music to my ears with hearing uh, Commissioner Chopra come on earlier. What, what most of you maybe do not know is that the Federal Trade Act, which gave rise to the Federal Trade Commission, has a section five that gives, gives the commission the authority to take action against abusive and unfair business practices. For some reason, for the last 50 years, the Federal Trade Commission has, has said its only authority in franchising is pre-sale disclosure, never been the law. About six months ago, uh, Keith called me up and said, Bob, what do you know about Section 5? Because Commissioner Chopra has wondered if he has authority under that section. And I turned around and gave uh, Keith uh, 25 years worth of, of correspondence that the AFD had been sending to the Federal Trade Commission. We now have an opportunity with a, with a commissioner that is willing to realize that they do have the authority to address unfair trade practices. That's number one. Number two, for most of those 50 years, there was one person at the Federal Trade Commission that had authority to even deal with franchising. Uh, that was Craig Tr Tregellis, who may, be, may well be on this call. Um, and that was only one of his duties. So uh, in the entire federal government, we had very little oversight of, of franchising. It sounds like that's about to change. Um, and so what does that mean for us practically? And, and um, I was, uh, and that is that for years, you, uh, your attorney would say, hey, don't bother complaining to the Federal Trade Commission. They don't ever do anything. Well, today, that's no longer the case. Today, uh, I'm, we are urging our attorneys to include a complaint to the Federal Trade Commission. And Keith is working hard to make sure that, that it's an easier process to file those complaints. So I want to urge you guys to write early and write often, I guess, as opposed to which is your way of voting to let the FTC know if there's something that, that's being done that you think is not fair and appropriate, such as making you buy stuff that you can buy cheaper someplace else that's not involved with your trademark, go for it. So I, I really appreciate uh, all of this. Uh, and I know that Keith's gonna talk also, but I wanna mention it here that that we've, we have never had a private right of action. That's something that has to be written into the law uh, under the Federal Trade Commission uh, authority under the tra Federal Trade Act or the franchise rule. We've never had a private right of action. That's something we're, we're hard at work on. Keith, back to you. And thank you guys for giving me well, 
I think that that's the end. And uh, thank you, Bob, for those comments. And thank you, Robert. Don't call me Bob Zarco <laughs> for uh, for being on this panel with me and then putting up with all my questions for you. So that hey, will Keith, close thank us. You. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. You are great, and that's always a pleasure working with you on this. And uh, it's a lot of a lot of really valuable information came out. I hope a lot of franchisees listen to this and those that didn't, I don't know if this stuff is recorded or not, but these are issues that we deal with every single day. It's common and at some time or another, every franchisee uh, hopefully will not deal with these issues, but they will arise. At least they know how to deal with them. All right. And thank you. And that'll close this session. Thank you all. Thank you.